Silently smoking a cigarette and gripping the wheel, Jerry sped down the highway on his way home from work. In the distance, he could see the ocean of brake lots waiting for him. <sighs> Just great. It had been a long day, and all he wanted was a beer, a blunt, and the remote for the TV. But traffic had other plans. Normally, this stretch of highway was smooth sailing. Tonight, it was a parking lot. As his car came to a stop, he let out a disgusted grunt and started trying to see what was causing the problem. In the distance, he could see the police and the emergency crews working to clear a wreck off the road. Thinking it wouldn't be much longer, he relaxed in his seat and turned up the radio. Traffic crawled along for close to half an hour till he was sitting next to an ambulance that had been on scene. The EMTs were standing near the rear of the vehicle, closing the doors and got a quick glimpse inside. There was a person covered by a white sheet on the gurney. As the door shut, he could have sworn he'd seen the person move. Brushing it off thinking he'd imagine it, he lit a cigarette and turned his attention back to the road. It took 10 minutes to pass the wreck and another 20 before he got home. The next morning, he was drinking his first cup of coffee. He turned on the television to catch the weather. He sat down through the usual barrage of bad news, high prices, strikes, and natural disasters. Then, just when he thought it was over, there was a broken story. It was about the wreck he had seen the night before. A woman who had apparently passed out behind the wheel was involved in an accident. Her name was Francine Gilbert. She was pronounced dead at the scene, but somehow revived on the way back to the hospital. According to the paramedics involved, the woman had to be restrained after waking up and violently attacking them. Of course, they blamed it on drugs and mental illness, but something about it made it uneasy. Maybe he had seen too many movies, or maybe he was overthinking it, but to him it felt wrong. The weekend flew by, and Monday morning he'd forgotten all about Francine and her miraculous recovery. After putting on his uniform and staring at himself in the mirror for a second, he grumbled. Well, fuck my life. Then headed off to work. After everything he had been through, he never thought he'd end up being a security guard. Every day was a monotonous, repetitive blur of bullshit and boredom. At this point, he spent the majority of his days praying for something to happen, but it never did. As the hours slid by, he watched the helicopters landing and taking off from the hospital across the road. They was busier than usual. Normally, he'd see two, maybe three helicopters a day, but... There had been six. The roads were busy as well. He'd been hearing sirens and seen emergency crews scrambling throughout the day. Another odd thing he noticed was the amount of people walking along the road. His post was located in an isolated area. There were a few small subdivisions around. The complex he was working for actually sat on the edge of one. Still, it was rare to see anyone walking this particular area. Other than his post and the hospital, there was nothing on this road besides a sewage processing station. Once again, he chalked it up to his imagination, building a scenario to keep himself entertained. Around 5.30 p.m., Sergeant Phillips, a stout older man with a shiny bald head and a bushy gray beard, stopped by to do a post check and shoot the shit. All clear as usual. So, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is, you're doing a great job. The bad news is, your relief called in and I'm gonna need you to do it a little longer. I'm trying to get someone in right now, but I'm not getting any responses. Shaking his head and letting out a sarcastic chuckle, Jerry patted his pockets looking for his smokes. And once he had them and got one lit, he glanced up at the sky, noticing a wall of dark clouds rolling in. No response, huh? Sounds about right. Because you're not getting a response from me either. I'm not pulling a double. I still haven't gotten paid from the last time. So fuck off and find somebody else. Sarge left and pulled his belt up. Ah, shit rose downhill, son. And guess who's at the bottom of said hill? He paused to look at Jerry and then started towards the golf cart. Hey, look on the bright side. Get some OT. A little extra money never hurts. Knowing arguing wouldn't change anything, Jerry scowled and stepped into the booth, slamming the door behind him. Fuck this job. He grumbled before flopping down in his chair and pulling out his phone. Queuing up a good scary movie on YouTube, he turned up the volume and started sketching the past time. It wasn't long before those dark clouds he'd seen blotted out of the sun and thunder rumbled across the sky. Around 7 o'clock, as the sun began to set, the first few drops of rain fell. By the look of things, it was going to rain all night, and if his relief didn't show up, he'd be stuck doing patrols in it. As that thought crossed his mind, the alarm for his 7.30 patrol sounded. Tilting his head back and closing his eyes, he took a deep breath and muttered, 
They don't pay me enough for this shit. Getting up and grabbing his ring gear, he cursed and grumbled complaints to himself. Normally this would be where he'd radio command and tell them he was starting his patrol. In his agitated state of mind, he slipped a radio in his pocket, grabbed the keys, and stormed out of the booth. The facility was huge. Each patrol covered 16 different checkpoints around the complex. By the end of the night, he would have covered 96 checkpoints in all, with the majority being outside. The first stop was Building E, a medium-sized tin building with a roll-up door. It was supposed to be used for storage, but at the moment, housed the golf carts used by the facility's work crew. He just finished checking the doors when the rain came pouring down. Luckily, Building G was next. It had cover, and he'd be able to hold up there for a second. Hurrying over, he locked the doors for the receiving bay and then scanned the marker and stood watching the rain. From where he was standing, he could see the sliding gate leading to the retention pond. There was also an area just beyond the trees that was used for testing. The company manufactured drilling equipment, and from time to time, they'd use the prototypes over there. It wasn't unusual to see animals back there. He'd seen deer, rabbits, possums, and skunks, to name a few. But tonight, the moment he caught something out of the corner of his eye, he got nervous. At first glimpse, it was hard to make out. His initial thought was deer. When he focused on it, he saw a man wearing a gray t-shirt and tan shorts walking the path leading to the test area. Grabbing the radio, he watched the guy for a few seconds and then called it in. Patrol one to command, come back. There was a burst of static, then Phillips replied. Send it. I've got a situation at the east access gate. I've got a single male heading into the testing area. Please advise. Uh, do not approach. I, I repeat, do not approach. I'll call the authorities and file an incident report. Stay put, I'm heading your way. Copy that. Slipping the radio back into his pocket, Jerry watched the trespasser till he vanished behind the trees. After a few minutes, Sergeant Phillips arrived in the golf cart. Rather than stopping near Jerry, he rode over to the gate and checked the lock first. When he was done, he hopped back on the cart and rode over. Uh, police are on their way. Were you able to get a good look at the guy? Shaking his head and pointed to the area where he had first spotted the man, Jerry described exactly what he'd seen. Because of the distance and the rain, he hadn't seen much, but there was one detail that stuck out. Trespasser was limping. It didn't seem to be stopping him, but it was noticeable. Phillips mentioned the terrain back there being rough and thought the guy had probably turned an ankle. Not knowing the area well enough to argue, Jerry agreed to the possibility, but what the sergeant said caught him by surprise. Uh, go back to your station and switch the cameras to the parameter. Stay in the booth. Armed personnel will do all the patrols tonight. If you have to use the shitter to go to building J, and your radio with you at all times. Seeing Phillips was so wound up instantly made him alert. Normally Sarge was fairly laid back and rarely wore his pistol, but tonight his 45 was on his hip and he was looking concerned. What happened? Should I get my gun out of my car? Uh, legally, I can't say yes to that, but if it happens, I'll look the other way. There was an incident at the hospital. We're getting reports of a riot. Like a full-blown riot? Or just a bunch of people yelling and talking shit? This one's looking pretty real to me. Some kid got shot by the cops at the hospital. The details we're getting aren't making sense. The boy was 14 and in critical condition before being shot by police. The kid had been hit by a Navy TV a few days earlier. As like I said, the reports don't make sense. All we know is a kid got killed and people are mad about it. So far, things are escalating and unfortunately, we're right across the road from it. As Sarge finished talking, Officer Briggs from Guard Station 1 came over the radio. After clearing the call, Philip sent Jerry back to his post. During his walk back, he stopped by his car and got his pistol out of the glove box. As he closed the door, a patrol car pulled up and let down his window. Jerry told him where to find the sergeant and then hurried to the booth and opened the gate. Once he had gotten out of his rain gear and put on a pot of coffee, he took a seat at the desk and started switching the cameras. The moment the rear gates came on screen, there was a problem. There's a bayou that runs behind the building separating it from the residential area. Occasionally, People would jog the paths or walk their dogs back there, but it was considered a low traffic area. Tonight, there were three people standing near the fence. At first, they weren't moving. They were all sniffing the air and looking around till something caught their attention. As the group took off running, Jerry realized they were heading straight for Sarge. 
Grabbing the radio, he tried to warn them. You've got three people approaching from the rear of the property. Don't open the gate. No response. Quickly switching the camera to, to the east gate, he saw the police officer and Sarge with their weapons drawn. There was no sound on the feed, but he could tell they were yelling commands at the trespassers. Whatever they were saying, it wasn't working. Taking a good look at the people, Jerry realized one of them was a little girl. The other two, a man and a woman, were banging against the gate, but the girl was looking for a way in. Trying the radio again, he yelled. Watch the girl. She's headed for the access gate. Hearing the call, Phillips turned to see the girl as she squirmed and squeezed her way through a slot gap between the rolling gate and the fence. The moment she was inside, she ran at Sarge. Rather than shooting her, he stepped back as she charged. When she got too close, he kicked her in the chest, sending her sprawling backwards across the ground. The officer ran over to get the girl under control, quickly overpowering her. He put her in the squad car, but not before taking several bites to his hands and arms. At this point, the other two made their way to the access gate, but all they could do was reach their arms through the gap. Mesmerized by what was unfolding on the scene, Jerry hadn't been paying attention to what was happening around him. A lone figure with a slot limp ran through the open field that sits on the right side of Jerry's post. He didn't see him till his hands were smacking against the glass. Nearly falling over in a seat, Jerry spun around and locked his eyes with a teenage boy. Frantically pounding his palms against the window, he begged for help. Letting him in would be breaking the rules, but judging by the looks of it, the kid was in danger. Hopping up from his seat, Jerry went to the door and hurried the boy inside. As the door slammed shut, the kid limped over to the window and started looking in the direction he'd just come from. Without taking his eyes off the window, he nervously muttered, they're, they're trying to kill me. Who's trying to kill you? Jerry fired back while locking the door. I don't know. They just started chasing me. Relax. Nobody's getting in here. The police are already on site. Sit down, catch your breath, and tell me what happened. Doing as he was told, the boy took a seat and tried to get himself together. Once he had calmed down a little, he explained, uh, I was taking a shortcut through the bayou because it was raining. When I got to the trail, I saw those freaks huddled around something on the ground. As soon as they saw me standing there, they came after me, so I ran. I thought I'd lost them when I found a spot behind the trees, but... They're here now. Please, man, you gotta help me. Getting a good look at the kid for the first time, Jerry noticed a bloody wound on his left calf. Calm down. What's your name? Aiden. Okay, Aiden. You're bleeding pretty bad. What happened to your leg? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think that bitch tried to bite me. Everything was happening so fast I couldn't pay attention. She caught me by the water before I crossed the bayou. When I got there, she fucking tackled me and we fell in. She was clawing at me, trying to drown me. I just kept kicking till she let go. When I got to the other side, my leg was hurting bad, but I had to run because the others were coming. Making a mental note of everything he'd just heard, Jerry grabbed the first aid kit and did his best to bandage the kid up. Once that was done, he turned his attention to the monitor and froze. Sergeant and the police officer weren't on camera. Grabbing the radio, he tried making contact, but got no response from Phillips or Briggs and GS1. Quickly switching cameras, he caught sight of the Sarge running to building E. The officer was on the ground near one of the generators being attacked by the guy from the gate while the woman ran after Phillips. Trying not to panic, Jerry split the screen and brought up the feed from GS1. The booth was empty, and Briggs' car wasn't in the lot. That motherfucker... He mumbled to himself before glancing out the window at his own car. Thinking of making a run for it, he side-eyed Aiden and considered leaving him there while he had the chance. As that thought crossed his mind, the sight of three more police cars racing down the street made him smile. Thinking they were about to pull in, he pressed the button and opened the gate, and then watched in shock as they sped by without stopping. No, 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 no! Where the fuck are they going? Grabbing the flashlight off the desk and rushing out to the street, he tried to flag them down, but it was too late. Standing by the side of the road, the sound of gunfire in the distance made him pause. Between the thunder and the pouring rain, he could have been mistaken, but as it continued, there was no doubt. Something was happening. Jerry had seen enough. He turned and headed straight for his car. He crossed the driveway and stepped into the grass, boarding up the parking lot. Aiden, who was standing in the doorway of the guard shack, yelled, They're coming! Run! four figures were racing towards him. There was no way he'd get to his car before they got to him. With no other option, J 
Jerry darted for the shack, managing to slip inside and slam the door before they got to him. The shack was made of steel and concrete with thick bulletproof glass and a heavy metal door. As long as that door was locked, there was no way anyone was getting in. Soaking wet, Jerry doubled over, gasping for air. Years of smoking and bad living had left him in pretty shitty shape. After taking a moment to gather himself, he noticed Aiden was curled up in a ball under the desk. Standing up straight and wiping the water out of his eyes, Jerry could hear the dull thudding of them pounding against the glass. It was so thick that their fists barely made a sound. Since they couldn't get inside, he took a moment to get a good look at their faces. One of them was a young woman with short hair wearing a Sonics uniform. There was a location near the freeway. He assumed she'd come from there. The right side of her face had been ripped away, exposing her skull, and now an empty eye socket. Her arms were a mere mess of shredded flesh that splattered and smeared bits of skin and blood on the glass. Next to her was an older guy in a torn red flannel shirt. He was missing an arm and his intestines dangling from a gaping hole in his gut. He snarled and pressed his face against the glass, attempting to bite at his own reflection. The third one was a kid with dreadlocks. There was an open wound on his neck, still gushing blood as he frantically clawed at the window. The last of them had already lost interest, but was wandering towards the road. It was a woman. Since her back was turned, Jerry couldn't get a good look at her. Judging by the way she was moving, he guessed her legs had been badly damaged. What the fuck is going on? He muttered to no one in particular as he watched the Sonics girl get distracted by something through her right. Glancing in to see what grabbed her attention, Jerry's jaw dropped. The sliding gate was still open, and Sergeant Phillips was on a golf cart being chased by the man and the woman from the east gate. When he sped by, the ones that had been banging on the windows joined the chase. He made it halfway across the parking lot before the kid with dreads caught up and jumped on the cart. Trying to shake him off, Phillips made a hard left and hitting a parking block. The impact caused the cart to tip over, landing on its side, sliding a few feet before coming to a stop. The kid was trapped under the cart, still swapping at the Sarge as he crawled out and got to his feet. Pulling his sidearm and firing into the swarm, he ran. He dropped two of them, but they were getting up. If he could make it to the command center and get inside, he'd be safe, but that was still a ways to go, and they were right behind him. Luck was on his side. As fast as those things were, they weren't all that coordinated. The rain was making the pavement slick, causing a couple of them to slip and fall. Only one was still close to him when he made it to the door. The flannel guy had somehow stayed upright, even though he was dragging a train of his own intestines. Easily avoiding the one-armed attack, Sarge brought the gun up and put a bullet through his brain. The flannel guy dropped and went still, buying Sarge just enough time to scan his badge and get inside. Letting out a sigh of relief, Jerry flopped down on his chair, covered his eyes with his hand for a second. Once he gathered himself, he turned his attention to Aiden. They're gone. You can come out now. The kid didn't respond, so he leaned forward to get a better look. The boy's eyes were open, but he wasn't moving. Shit. Grabbing his pistol off the desk, Jerry got up and headed to the door. The crowd was still at the command center. He could get to his car now. Taking one last look out the window, making sure the coast was clear, he made a break for it. He was out of the door, crossed the lot, and in his car faster than he had thought, but he wasn't alone. He hadn't seen the shredded corpse of the police officer shambling towards the passenger side of his car. His body was so damaged he barely looked human. All the skin from his face to his chest had been ripped away. His arms had been chewed down to bone and he'd been partially gutted. When he smacked against the window, Jerry nearly shit his pants. His first reaction was to grab the gun, fire, shattering the window, and deafening himself in the process. Ears ringing and disoriented, he fumbled with the keys for a second while the thing was outside his window pounded on the side of the car. The commotion got the crowd's attention. As they ran and hobbled their way towards him, he managed to get the keys in the ignition. The cop who was now reaching into the car took a few messy swaps at Jerry, splattering clumps of bloody flesh everywhere as he cranked the engine. He wouldn't be able to put the car in drive with that thing so close to him. Taking the gun out of his lap, he fired a second shot. This time, its head snapped back and it stopped moving. Throwing the car in drive, Jerry smashed the gas and sped out of the lot, watching his pursuers vanish from sight in the rearview mirror. 